Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course which lasts for two days. OK. Or there's the four-day beginners course, which is what most people do first. I'd tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days depending on conditions. We might try the beginners course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is $190. The beginner's course, which is probably what you'd be looking at, is $320. No, sorry, $330. It's just gone up. And the pilot course is $430. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you $12 a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their belongings, but not theft or injury. You would need to take out your own personal accident insurance. I see. And what's the best way to get to your place? By public transport or could we come by bike? We're pretty keen cyclists. It's difficult by public transport, though there is a bus from Newcastle. Most people get here by car, though, because we're a little off the beaten track. But you could ride here, OK? I'll send you a map. Just let me take down a few details. What's your name? Maria Gentle. And your address, Maria? Well, I'm a student staying with a family in Newcastle. So it's care of... Care of Mr and Mrs MacDonald. Like the hamburgers? <laughs> yes, exactly. MacDonald. The post office box address is probably best. It's P.O. Box 676, Newcastle. Is there a fax number there? Because I could fax you the information. Yes, actually there is. It's 0249, that's for Newcastle, and then 775431. OK, now if you decide to do one of our courses, you'll need to book in advance and to pay when you book. How would you be paying? Uh, by credit card, if that's OK. Do you take Visa? Yes, fine. We take all major cards, including Visa. OK, then. Thanks very much. The girl is telling her friend about the course. Look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Hi, Pauline. Hi, Maria. What's that you're reading? Just some information from a paragliding school. It looks really good fun. Do you fancy you go at paragliding? Sure. Do you have to buy lots of equipment and stuff? Not really. The school provides the equipment, but we'd have to take a few things along. Such as? Well, it says here, clothes, uh, Wear stout boots, so no sneakers or sandals, I suppose. And clothes suitable for an active day in the hills. Preferably a long sleeve t-shirt. That's probably in case you land in the stinging nettles. It also says we should bring a packed lunch. 
we do not recommend soft drinks or flasks of coffee. <laughs> Water is really the best thing to drink. Uh, we need to bring suntan lotion and something to protect your head from the sun. Okay, that sounds reasonable. And where would we stay? Well, look, they seem to operate a campsite too, because it says here that it's only $10 a day to pitch a tent. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? And that way would save quite a bit, because even a cheap hotel would cost money. Uh, or perhaps we could stay in a bed and breakfast nearby. It gives a couple of names here we could ring. I think I might prefer that. <laughs> uh, hotels and youth hostels would all be miles away from the farm, and I don't fancy a caravan. No, I agree. But let's take a tent and pray for good weather. OK, let's do it. <laughs> what about next weekend? No, I can't. I'm going on a geography field trip. And then it's the weekend before the exams, and I really do need to study. OK, then. Let's make it the one after the exams. Fine. We'll need a break by then. Can you ring and let me know if you can find out some... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear Dr. Joanna Robinson, the course director of a language learning centre, answering questions from reporters from the student newspaper. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to the Language Learning Center. I'm Joanne Robinson. You must be the reporters from the Examiner. Please come in and sit down. Hello, Dr. Robinson. Yes, we're from the Examiner. I'm Cheryl Perkins, and this is Don Klim. May I start with a question? Did this college really start with Brazilian students? It did. The Language Learning Center was founded in 1985 to look after a group of students from Brazil who wanted to study here. Those 20 students soon grew to 60, and as you can imagine, we had severe accommodation problems. Somebody said you were in the old amenities block, right near the engineering school. They have a good memory. Yes, we were there because the university hadn't believed we would expand so quickly. The problem wasn't solved until we moved into these new premises in Bancroft House in 1987. When did you start taking students from other countries? About 1990. We now have students from 13 different countries enrolled, and we expect a large group from Turkey next month. Yes, we've noticed a lot more advertisements for Turkish restaurants in our advertising section. Well, 40% of our students come from Turkey, by far the largest single national group and I believe there's been an influx to the rest of the university. There are a lot of Turkish students studying hospitality. Do you offer anything special to the students? Yes, we do. There are several things which make us rather different from other language schools. English is certainly not restricted to English for academic purposes here. Sometimes we have extra classes for students who have particular courses in mind. And we have just said goodbye to a group of 30 Indonesian students who were preparing for a university course in agriculture. They came to us for English for Farming, and they were with us for a long time. We miss them. How long do students usually stay at the Language Learning Center? It varies, so I'll talk about the average. Most of our courses last for five weeks. 
But to make any real progress, a student needs to be here for at least three terms. That's 15 weeks. The students do better if they have a little time to settle in at the beginning of the course, and we offer an orientation course that lasts a week. Most students take it. It helps them to settle down, and it gives us plenty of time to test them and place them at the right level. How many people are in each class? We sometimes go up to 18. But our average class size is 14 students, and some classes have as few as seven participants. It depends on the needs of the group. You were saying that you miss your students when they go. How do you attract students? I mean, how do they hear about the Language Learning Centre in the first place? We're included in the university advertising and marketing, and we have our own website. The thing which works best for us, though, is word of mouth. Students who leave us often send us their friends. In fact, a student who arrived today was carrying a photograph for me of a former student and his baby. It sounds like a nice place to be. It is. A lot of our students make lasting friendships while they're here. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Making friends with other students sounds special enough. I'd like to emphasize that in the student newspaper. We do try to get our students to be part of the wider university. How do you do that? Do you encourage them to join the sports center, for instance? Indeed, we do. The sports center is always looking for active participants, particularly in soccer. Oh, and something else. You might like to mention that we don't teach just English here. I mean, we're a language center, not an English language center. You may learn Spanish, Mandarin, and Russian here, and we can sometimes offer other languages. This means we can have some students who are native speakers of those languages as conversation partners for English-speaking students. Who can do these courses? At this stage, any native speaker of English. What about the people who are learning English? Can they do a non-English language course? At this time, only if they've almost finished their English language course. You see, we try very hard to involve students who are native speakers of English as conversation leaders, and we encourage our students to join groups on the campus. For instance, if they enjoy music, there is an active jazz group available to everyone, and that's a lot of fun. On the other hand. Elementary students can't go to the drama group. Their English just isn't ready for that sort of activity. But the university choir welcomes all the singers it can find. They often do large productions that need a lot of voices. I imagine the special conversation groups are open to all your students. I wish they were. I'm sorry to say they're a special service we provide for elementary students only. Is there anything else I can tell you? I'd be really pleased if you could write about the courses we offer in foreign languages. I think our readers will be very interested in that. Thank you for your time, Dr. Robinson. Yes, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the center. It's always good to let the rest of the students at the university know what goes on in our classrooms and outside them. After all, many of our students leave us and then study for degrees in various disciplines on this campus. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students called Jane and Mark talking to their tutor about the project assignments for their senior thesis. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-three.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. So, you were both given your project assignments for your senior thesis today, right? Yes, and we already have to submit our topics next week. But how could they give us a grade this soon? No, next week's due date will not be counted towards your final grade. The teachers are just going to read your topic and give you feedback. Oh, I see. So first we should come up with our topics, and then what? Well, once you know what you want to study, you need to think about how you'll study it. You need to decide on your research methods. The methods will be the main part of your paper. What about the results section? Well, I can give you feedback on that, but you will be the one carrying out an experiment, and thus will have to produce the results on your own. What I would like to do today is practice writing research papers before you even begin your report. I'll give you samples of old data from past experience, and you can practice writing results and drawing conclusions. I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of extra work, but I'm sure it would make our actual project easier. You're exactly right. So let's get started. First, let's try this simple experiment on fruit flies. Read the information and then take 25 minutes to summarize a results and conclusion section. That's really important. Pay attention to the time limit. OK. Does it still have to be 6,000 words? No, don't worry about that. What if we get off topic? I wouldn't worry too much. You'll have so much information to write about that it should be easy to stay on topic. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. But what about other sources? Well, for this assignment, you can use the one from your textbook. In your actual paper, you should find old experiments that support your topic. So do we need to find different types of sources? For instance, should I be conducting lots of interviews to use in my paper? No, there's no need to conduct lots of interviews or anything like that. OK, I'm ready to get started. I'm still a little confused, though, on how we should format our paper. Don't worry about it for now, but on your final paper, make sure to pay attention to the format. It should follow the guidelines exactly. Oh, man, I'm starting to understand why they give us all semester to do this. Are there any other small details like that that we should know about? Not a whole lot. Make sure you provide two copies. One for your teacher, of course, but one for yourself as well. And, of course, you know the due date, right? Uh, it's April the 11th, right? What? No, it's May 11th, right? Yes, the due date is May 11. Write it down. Oh, wow, yeah, I need to note it. Also, I'm having trouble finding information on my topic. What if I can't find enough good sources? It's all right to change your topic. Just make sure to do it before the beginning of April. Oh, really? Well, I'm, I'm definitely going to change it then. Just make sure to write a note to your teacher letting him or her know. OK, so getting back to writing this sample paper, where do we start? Should I just explain the experiment and what happened? Well, you need to start with your hypothesis, what do you think will happen, and then describe your procedure. Then you can write up the results and your conclusions. Oh, boy. I don't know if I can handle any more instructions. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator, giving advice on how to get your first job or commission as an artist. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Now listen carefully, and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-five. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983. I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art, and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student, and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student, you're pushed along by fellow students and tutors, and the driving force is there. However. When you leave college, you find yourself saying things like, "I'll have one more cup of coffee and then I'll sit down to work." <laughs> I, I hate to admit it, but I say it myself. Suddenly, it isn't finding the inspiration or getting the right paper that's a problem; it's you. In my view, there are a number of reasons why this happens. It's a real challenge making a decent living as a new artist. You have to find a market for your work. Often, you work freelance and need to take samples or portfolios of your work from place to place. These experiences are common to a lot of professional people, but artists also have to bare their souls to the world in a way. More than anything, they want praise. If people don't like what they create, then it can be a very emotional and upsetting experience hearing them say this. I began to realise that these problems were preventing me from having a career in art, and so I decided to experiment. I was a painter, but I started to dabble in illustration, drawing pictures for books, cards, and this offered me the opportunity to become more emotionally detached from my work. I was no longer producing images from the heart, but developing images for a specified subject, taking a more practical approach. I began to develop a collection of my illustrations, which I put into a portfolio and started to carry around with me to show prospective clients and employers. But it was still tricky because publishers, for example, want to know that your drawings will reproduce well in a book, but without having had any work published. It's hard to prove this. Having a wonderful portfolio or a collection of original artwork is, of course, a first step. But what most potential clients would like to see is printed artwork, and without this evidence, they tend to hold back still when it comes to offering a contract. Look at questions thirty-six to forty. Now answer questions thirty-six to forty. Well, I overcame this problem in two ways, <clears throat> and I, I suppose this is my advice to you on preparing your portfolio of your best work. The first way was by submitting my work for a competition, and the one I chose was for a horoscope design and was sponsored by a top women's magazine.
There are a few of these competitions each year, and they offer new illustrators an opportunity to showcase their work. The other approach I took was to design and print some mock-up pages of a book. In other words, I placed some of my illustrations next to some text in order to demonstrate how my work would look when it was printed. <laughs> Perhaps I was lucky in that I, I had taken a degree that provided me with all-round creative skills, so that I could vary my style and wasn't limited to a certain technique. Now I think that is important. The art world and many other creative fields do try to pigeonhole people into snug boxes with an accompanying label. Now I think you should try to resist this if you feel it happening to you. If you don't. You'll find it difficult to have new work accepted if you try to develop your style at a later stage in your career. Nevertheless, when you start out, and particularly when you're going for an interview, it's important not to confuse people by having a lot of different examples in your portfolio. One remedy for this is to separate your work into distinct categories. In my case. I did this by dividing my design-inspired illustrations from my paintings. It's then easier to analyse the market suited to each portfolio, such as magazines, book jackets, CD covers, etc. Working under two names is also useful, as it clarifies the different approaches and offers a distinction between them. I think it's been hard for artists to be recognised in anything other than the pigeonholes that they've been placed in. But luckily, these barriers are slowly being demolished. So I really do wish you all the best. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.